Thank you. It is, it is February 13, 2024. It's 6.30 and I'm calling the meeting of the Community Resources Committee together. I mean, I'm, I'm calling the meeting and um, pursuant to the ch to chapter 20 of the Act of 2021, extend by chapter 22 and 107 of the Act of 2022 and extended again by chapter two of the Act of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public is possible, but every, every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time being via technological means. So we have called the meeting to order. It was at 6.30 and we have no public hearings. We do have public comment, and we'll see if we have some folks in the in the audience. Looks like we do. I'm not able. Here we here we go. So we have a couple folks in the audience to talk about um, anything within the jurisdiction of the CRC. There may be another opportunity after we discuss some of the action items for a second round of public comment. Um, but for now, I'm going to ask if anyone in the audience wants to weigh in on with public comment up to three minutes and um, public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of the CRC. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the discretion of the chair based on the number of people who want to speak. The CRC will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment period. Anyone in the audience uh, want to raise your hand? Okay, I'm not, I'm not seeing any. <clears throat> Last call, last call for some public comment at this point before we jump into our action items. Okay, well, we may come back to it. Um, action item uh, 4A, we want to discuss the ZBA vacancies. Um, to begin with, the sufficiency of the applicant pool and some of our options to proceed. Um, I will start by just recapping what we what we have received from folks in the community as far as community activity forms we have we have eight paths in our possession for the zba people mentioned they wanted to be considered um we have immediate needs for the zba and that is that there is a vacancy for the remainder of a, of a three-year term, which would be for approximately a year and a half through the end of June, 2025. And we have an ongoing associate member position vacant, which at this point would be for five months, four or five months through June of 2024. To also perhaps consider are the ZBA terms beginning July 1, 2024, um, a, a full member position uh, completes a term, and that same member has actually submitted a, a uh, CAF for consideration of renewal. There will also be four associate member terms because they are only one-year terms for um, July 1 to the end of June 2025. Any thoughts on sufficiency of pool and possible next steps. Mandy Joe. Councillor Hannick. Thank you. If I'm reading this correctly, for the current vacancies, the ones that are open right now, there are potentially seven applicants. Um because the the person that you just said has who has submitted a CAF who's currently a full member because the term is expiring, wouldn't be eligible for that, but the other seven would be at least eligible for the remainder full term. Um, 
some of those obviously are associates maybe now that wouldn't be, but seven applicants for two spot, spots seems fairly sufficient to me um, that we should probably go forward with them. And then if we're looking at the July ones to try and sort of be a little more efficient, um, we have eight applicants for five slots. Um, depending on who got a, but and and if we appointed someone to the current vacant full associate, we'd have seven people for those five slots in a sense. Um, not as sufficient as I would like, but at the same time, I also promote efficiency in our work. <laughs> so I I feel like it might be time to 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 say that the pool is sufficient to move to interval interviews um so that we can get moving on this um it might be hard to find a time that eight applicants are available for interviews too so it might take us a little bit to actually get to those interviews um but it i think it's probably worth personally i think it might be worth moving in that direction thank you Pat. I'm hearing your call for efficiency, Mandy, but I feel uncomfortable having um, five open slots in July and only seven applicants. Uh, some of them, you know, I, it just makes me uncomfortable. So I would like to move ahead with the current spots, the current vacancies um, and to work again on the vacancies that will occur in July. Thank you, um, Jennifer. You're muted. I'm sorry. I agree with Councillor Haneke. Um, so we had one applicant for a long time. So we've come a long way now to have eight. And um, yeah, so I think with that we have pretty good, I think it's, you know, we have more applicants than spaces um, and we can keep you know, for the next, so this is a question I have, until we schedule the interview, so we're going to have to do, poll all of us to see when we're available, and then poll the applicants, can, can CAF still be coming in during that time? You know, because we could continue to do outreach, but I would feel comfortable moving ahead with the eight that we have, you know, and seeing if we can get more in the next week or two. But we're a long way from where we were when we had one. Councilor Haneke. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I understand, Pat, where you're coming from um, in terms of wanting more. What I worry about and think is thinking about the timing. If we ask seven and it would be seven members to come in if we weren't looking to fill the july vacancies it would be seven of the eight applicants to come in um because one is not eligible they're already on the board um <laughs> as a full member there's there's no movement there um and we appoint one for four months and one for a year and a half the year and a half person is is done for the next openings but the four month person is not i and then we've got, which means we've, we've passed over or chose not chosen, you know, cause two, two openings for seven slots, five people. What I worry given how hard it's been to get to this point is that some of those five would not come back for a second interview, which we would be mandated to do in a short amount of time to get these positions filled by June 30. I mean, we're already mid-February. I imagine that we're not going to be able to hold interviews for at least three or four weeks minimum, which means the interviews would be mid-March. And then we'd be looking at holding interviews two months later. Um, and I worry that our applicant pool would go from eight for those five slots or seven for those five slots to like three 
for those five slots, um, which is more problematic than seven for five slots. So th that's my worry, given our history with ZBA candidates in particular of struggling to even get enough. I mean, the associate term has been vacant since July. Um, so I, I guess I just respectfully disagree, Pat, with your position, even though even though I understand where it's coming from and it's certainly not as sufficient as I would like, I, I think it's the, I, I think we should still move forward. I, I had deciding to weigh in and, and was thinking about the fact that some of the folks who have submitted a new CAF are people that are currently um, on the board as associate members and or full members and that, um, it may just be a, a, a shifting of a, of a couple positions if if they were to assume different roles in this coming round. Um, I would love to see I would love to see more people. I am I am pleased that at the moment those who have submitted CAFs do outnumber the the current openings and and. It could be that we end up, if we were to look forward into the next year, um, it could be that we still have some vacancies that we might need to fill, you know, as of July 1. I would I would be more comfortable for the sake of the ZBA chair, knowing that in this case, he has a as much of a complement of of board members as as we can provide him it is it's our responsibility to keep his board full and um i i think in this case i would i would agree with with mandy that that may be the route that i would feel comfortable with anybody else mandy um, I guess I'll make a formal motion to declare the applicant pool for current vacancies and impending vacancies that are impending for July 2024 uh, sufficient to move forward to interviews for ZBA. There a second. Second, Jennifer. Okay. Uh, let's take that to a vote then. Any other comments? Uh, let's start, I'm just gonna go across the board with my pictures here. Uh, Jennifer Taub. Yes. Counselor Ette. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. That I. <laughs> um, Pam Rooney is an aye. Counselor Haneke. Aye. So it's a unanimous that we will um, we will approach both current and coming vacancies as a as a package. To that end, um, I did put a draft um, amendment. If that if this was going to happen, I put a draft amendment in our packet. I think it made it into the packet but it is the bulletin board notice and I believe we have to amend it in order to um, let people know that we are considering um, beyond just the two current vacancies. And I'm looking to Mandy Johanneke to confirm that. Yeah, it does need amended, but that, that begs the vote we just took. I had thought that had been posted I think our town council policy does not allow us to declare the pool sufficient for those until that's been posted for 14 days. Um, say that again. So I think the town, the, the charter says we cannot appoint until the postings of the impending vacancies have been up for 14 days, but I believe the town council policy on making recommendations is that we can't declare the pool sufficient for vacancies until the vacancies have been posted for 14 days. And so my motion was based on the thought that that had already happened. If that bulletin board notice has not changed yet to 
post the July 1 impending vacancies, we probably need to go back and revote the sufficiency of the pool vote because we can't vote the July 1 pool sufficient until the vacancy notice has been posted for 14 days. Well, we, we couldn't do that tonight anyway until you all voted on it to, uh, to, amend, the, uh, to amend the announcement. That's why it's in our packet tonight. I thought last week, last meeting, we had voted or agreed to allow you to just amend it. Oh, I didn't understand. I thought we oh. had to. Um, I thought we had to vote on the wording of it, and that everybody had to approve. And mm -hmm. then I could hear that was with Athena. So, um, if that was the intention, it could go into the packet tomorrow. But would it still have to be there for two, for two weeks? Technically, it does under the policy from that the council has passed. Can we vote to um, waive the policy? We cannot. The council can waive it, but we as a committee cannot. It's a council policy. So here's a potential option, thinking on the fly. We reconsider our vote that we just took, um, amend it, or just withdraw that one and ignore it. Um, <laughs> somehow and and revote sufficiency for the positions that have been noticed. Post the notice, but as you are looking to schedule interviews, schedule them far enough out. Potentially, I mean, it this would delay filling the other two, but if that. The notice isn't probably going to be able to be posted tonight, but 14 days if it's posted tomorrow is technically probably, if you count tomorrow as one, two weeks, 14 days would be our next meeting if it gets posted tomorrow. Um, so we could declare the pool for those potentially sufficient tomorrow, if, if it gets modified. Um, can we, can we vote to, can we vote? That the pool is sufficient, and that the and that the um, terms of the bulletin board announcement will be modified to reflect that as soon as possible, so that any interviews would be. Um... Well, you're not going to be able to schedule interviews for less than three or four weeks. So, if we declare the pool sufficient next week, next meeting for those vacancies, but we start trying to find interview dates now, it won't slow down the two openings that are now. Because once interviews are scheduled, you have to allow times for statements of interest to be submitted. And those statements of interest have to be posted on the meeting notice seven days in advance of the interviews. So, you know, we're, we're, we're looking already at, at, you know, from the time you pick an interview date, you can't pick one less than like 10 days out, right? Once you get everyone's response back. So we're, that's why I say we're probably looking at interviews in mid-March, no matter what, um, which means our next CRC meeting would be early enough to satisfy the requirements of the town council policy by declaring that pool sufficient prior to the interviews. So Does that make sense? Our, our next CRC meeting is March 12. That's practically a month from now. Don't we have one February 27th? That's our agenda item 4C. I have one listed as February 27th. We added February right. 27 in. You're right. You're right. February 27, you're correct. Good, it just didn't go on my wall calendar. Would you like to, would you like to um, raise your motion? Well, I'm trying to figure out how we backtrack the prior motion because it included both. So, I move to amend the previously adopted motion to 
delete the reference to the impending vacancies that will be vacant as of July of 2024. There is a second. Second. <clears throat> Jennifer, second. Thank you. So just for Athena's sake, the intention is to remove everything such that the prior motion is just declaring the pool sufficient for the two vacancies that are actual vacancies right now. Councilor Ette had his hand raised. Thank you, Councilor Ette. Still up? I'm just wondering, so what would be the difference between this new motion and um, withdrawing the previous one and having a new motion where we declare the pool sufficient for the one spot rather than the one coming up later in the year. Andy? Having to only vote once instead of twice. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, that 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 literally is the difference. Is we only need one vote if we do this one. <laughs> I'm seeing everyone ready, so I will call the vote. Um, again, Jennifer. Yes. Council Ete. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Cam Rooney is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Thank you. It's unanimous with the amended the amended motion. Um, so we will proceed at this point to uh, focus on the current vacancies. The next step would be to reach out to everyone who submitted a CAF um, who would be eligible. In other words, not an active not an active um, board member today to fill the actual the actual vacancies. And then and and request statements of interest. And I I have a concern about that because I could see very easily having someone who is currently a serving member be appropriate to fit into a longer term full position if that was a choice of ours. Um, uh, Jennifer. Would you're saying somebody applies from now to fill a position from now until June but we might decide that they're appropriate. I just want to make sure I'm understanding it correctly for, for the fuller term. Yeah. And then the issue would be that if it hasn't been posted for other people. I guess that's what I'm asking. What, why would we, what would be the drawback? Because we've done that before, we've had, haven't we had people apply to be an alternate and then asked if they would want to be considered for full member? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Andy. I, I guess I'm, I'm not quite sure what your question is. I think that's what Jennifer was asking too, is we have a full a vacancy to fill the remaining term for a full member that's a little under a year and a half now. So it ends June, 2025 and an associate vacancy opening right now that ends June, 2024. Um, anyone who's not currently a full member can apply to that. Yeah, okay, okay. Okay. And if we happen to appoint someone who is an associate member to that, we could their their va their their associate member term would then be essentially vacant. 
right? Um, but only till June 2024, the remaining length of their term, we could potentially fill that with a new associate member for those three months at the same meeting. Okay. That's my yeah. question. That makes more sense. Because I, I, I think we wrote the, the current board notice a little... At, I think we wrote at least one associate member vacancy. I think we didn't say it was just one. To at least at least one. Yeah, to to hedge on that exact mm -hmm. matter. So, I'm just going to ask sort of a technical process question then. So, if we if we move forward, we we post an amended bulletin board notice, which says, hey, by the way, we're also looking to look ahead into next year. Is that now void, null and void, or do we just simply start that process from scratch with, we're looking for one full member plus four associate members? I would, I would, if, if the timing were such, I certainly would be very open to having a pool sufficient to look at, at all of those vacancies. And the people can plan ahead. They say, oh, okay, I got something for three months, but I'm also signed up for next, you know, another year after that. So that's, you know, I can deal with that kind of thing. Jennifer and then, and then Mandy. Maybe I should let Mandy go. I mean, this is probably for later in the just, just out there for some point. Would it be just easier if the alternates serve for the same amount of time as the full members and then we weren't, this is just like very, there's always somebody getting on and off and on and off. I mean, wouldn't it just be easier to have everybody serve for the same, what is it, two or three year term, whether you're an alternate or, and what I've observed with the ZBA is often alternates do serve because you have to serve for a complete application so it seems like it's it's not like the alternates only serve very infrequently. So it seems like if they signed, if they were appointed for the full three years, it's not like they would just be, you know, sitting around. They wouldn't be just an alternate name only. They would actually be um, reviewing applications during that time. But that's maybe for a future conversation. Oh, Mandy. So to answer Jennifer's question, the charge and our bylaw set the, the associate member term at one year. State law may actually set it at one year too. I'm not sure, but associate members are a state law thing. I, I'd have to look up the state law, but the associate member length might actually be set by state law um, such that we couldn't change it. If it's just the zoning bylaw um, and the charge, in theory, we could. But if it is state law, we can't. And I just don't. So it may or may not be able to be changed. Um, the point of amending the bulletin board notice is to be able to use the current process for those impending vacancies, too, without having to require those that submitted CAVs since CAF since November to resubmit a new CAF for those impending vacancies because the town council policy says once you post a vacancy, only the CAF submitted after that vac that bulletin board, board notice was up are considered applicants. Hence the desire to modify the current bulletin board notice to include the impending vacancies such that the people who just submitted CAFs three weeks ago do not have to submit another one in four weeks when we would start normally start the process for filling vacancies and when the planning board process vacancy recommendation process will actually begin um, somewhere in mid-March to early April, that process begins. and all CAFs need submitted after that date. So, so to answer Pam's question, once that bulletin board notice is modified and two weeks have passed, then we can, as a committee under the council policy, declare the pool for those vacancies sufficient. 
if we happen to have interviews set shortly after that, that everyone has had time to submit CAFs, uh, SOIs for after this new these vacancies are posted, we could potentially use those interviews for all of the openings, not just the two that are currently open. Um, Thank you. But at this point, yeah. that would be decided at that time, right? So we'd we'd make those formal decisions once the bulletin board notice has been posted and we know dates and all. But yeah, we we could potentially be done with the process together. That's the, that was my whole goal in suggesting it. I'll say that. <laughs> yeah. So I will I will proceed with with um, forwarding the draft amendment. And it's now not, I guess, not a draft. It is the approved amendment. Um, and the wording simply says, in addition to what's there now, it says the CRC may also consult, consider filling positions that will be vacated as of June 30, 2024, uh, semicolon one full member position, term to expire June 30, 2027, and four associate members, terms to expire June 30, 2025. And that was the only wording that was added to our current bulletin board announcement. If I have permission, I will send that off to um, Athena tomorrow, tonight, and um, have her have her amend the bulletin board announcement. Okay, I think we've spent enough time on this. Thank you. Um, have we covered? Uh, so, so just and then next next step though is to is to start the process of looking for interview dates, and as soon as we, um, but we also need to have statements of interest in hand in order to do that. No. For interview dates before statements of interest are out, you just pull are in. You pull everyone who is a current currently considered an applicant. Okay. And so at the same time, we say you're considered an applicant. We're we're starting to get uh, interview dates. You need to send in your statement of interest. Sorry, sorry, everybody. This process is not. Ooh, sorry. Yes. Um the there there are in SharePoint, there's a, a cheat sheet of when you have to do stuff and when to ask stuff. But yeah, in in short, yes, you would contact every current everyone who is currently considered an applicant and and tell them they should send in their statement of interest. And I, I always did a poll through a, a form, a, an online form. I will send you a, a a copy of that form so that you can just modify it. It makes it a lot easier to see who's available when, which date's easiest. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, but but you can do those things together, and you can set a tentative statement of interest deadline for submission, and then once you know an interview date, you can set a final deadline but okay. only those who submit statements of interest will actually come to the interview and be interviewed under the policy. Okay, we can we can discuss that offline. We don't need to take up people's time who are here patiently waiting here at the meeting. Thank you very much for that guidance. Um, let's move to action items um, B. Or B, which is discussing the bylaw, the, the rental bylaw, the reg regulations, and the fee structure. I would like um, I would like very much to look at the regulations that were put together that were in our packet, and I think that there were some. We we got a lot of really. Uh, good information in our conversation with landlords last time. There in our document that Mandy may be able to pull up, we have the 2023 December 14 version, which has a number of red lines and strikeouts. 
So I think it would be helpful to pull that up if we could. Is my thinking that we can go through these and I'd like to I'd like to discuss the red lines and we've we've gone through this before briefly, but I think I would like to come away with um, decisions on the things that have been highlighted and um, come to agreement on the wording so that we can wrap up if possible this particular document. I was going to ask David Zomak if if Rob Mora is around. I don't know that we specifically need his help, but it may be helpful. Rob, Rob is here. He is. Why am I he, not seeing? Why am I not seeing? There he is. You were below my screen. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. I'm embarrassed. Okay, so let's start at the very top. This is the, the, the regulations that are associated with the residential rental property by law. And um, we, have, um, we have eliminated item number G. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm gonna pause just for a second. Any suggestions on other methods of attacking this document? Any other thoughts? I can no longer see Mandy, so I don't see your hand up. Okay, we'll just keep going here. Okay, so item G, which was the number of dwelling units that were occupied by someone attending a higher ed institution has been struck. We are no longer going to ask, we would no longer ask for that kind of information on um, the, essentially the occupation of um, rental units. We understand that many people in their in their leases might ask for an occupation, but we are not going to require it by this bylaw. Um, frequency schedule B. We could scroll down. And Mandy, perhaps you can comment on this. Yeah. Um you know the the note i did at the december meeting was that the the there was a suggestion made to reduce the number of units inspected for multi for multi unit buildings uh, large multi unit buildings if if you consider anything above 10 units or 25 units large um and we had not finished that discussion. So it's still in there as 10, um, moving from 25, a minimum of 25 units inspected for any building that is over 25 units, um, but at least 20%. So where that 20% would come, it, so it would be 25 units for every building up to buildings with 125 units and once you or parcels with 125 units and once you get above 125 units on a parcel then you would inspect 20 percent that's what we had originally proposed and voted to the council back in i don't know august <laughs> there has been a request to modify that down um, to at least 10 units and 10 percent so you would and and at least 10 percent so that means that parcels with rental units above up to 100 rental units on them would have 10 units inspected. And if you have over 100 units on the parcel, you would have 10% of your units inspected. Um, and we didn't finish that discussion, um, partially because I think we had questions for Rob and Rob had not fully thought about what that change might do. So. Personally, I'm hoping that Rob can give us some guidance on his thoughts on this potential change. And so I guess I could, that would be a question for me to Rob, but yeah. 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 And, if, and if I could add, it would, it would be a reflection perhaps of how much staff time would be required to implement. Rob. Yeah, Rob. 
so I, it's not really a large number of properties that fall into this category. So I think the, the discussion was more about, you know, what does it translate to for the number of inspections, uh, you know, to support the fee schedule that's needed was really the bigger question. Um, as you get into those higher number properties, there's, there's fewer of them uh, that I don't think, um, you know, I don't think it makes a, di a big enough difference. No, I, I know it doesn't make a big enough difference to say change the number of people we need to have assigned to the program. Uh, so it really, you know, to me it comes down to how many inspections do we need to do in a year to uh, support the program. Jennifer? Yeah, and I guess I would also ask, you know, how many you feel you need to do to have a sense, you know, that, you know, that's sufficient enough pool that you would feel like, you know, you have it, you've looked at enough, enough units in a building have been inspected that you feel comfortable that if a certain percentage is up to code, they probably, most of them are. Yeah, I'm fairly comfortable with reducing the 10 percent for that matter. Uh, a lot of these properties that have that number of units will be subject to some other inspection for at least a portion of their uh, their number of units. So we'll have access to those documents as well. And I think if, you know, in 10 units, if we see something we're not comfortable with, if we find things in the common areas that raise further questions, we'll have the opportunity to increase that number if we need to. Thank you. Andy, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. So, when, uh, Rob, sorry. I, when you're ready to move on from that, I just wanted to go back to 1A whenever you're ready to talk about that, about the dwelling unit versus property and the exceptions. Let's, let's do that right now. Okay, so the the original language um, had the five year requirement, except for when, uh, oh, unless the dwelling unit is exempt from inspection, we struck that out and we put in property in its place. I don't remember exactly the conversation that caused that to happen, but the bylaw actually says property or dwelling unit. And I think in this section, we either need to either do the same, go back to dwelling unit or just say, unless, an applicable exemption of the inspection requirement, you know, is determined something like that because uh, we do have uh, subsidized housing uh, section eight vouchers in smaller properties, uh, although it's less common. Uh, I just wouldn't want to say on a, in a simple example, if there's a two family dwelling, one of them has a uh, occupant that has a voucher. I wouldn't want to exempt the entire property. I'd want to actually have the inspection of the adjacent property that wouldn't get the inspection by the uh, housing authority inspector or whatever agency is inspecting under that program. I'm, I'm looking at Mandy with her cursor. <laughs> My feeling is is that the word dwelling unit is is maybe more appropriate because that's where the flexibility I I um it seems like that's where the flexibility would be. Yeah, the, if it was a dwelling unit, we could we'd have the option to exempt all dwelling units. You know, so that that works, but I think also subject to an applicable exemption, you know, also allows that to be interpreted as the bylaw uh, specifies the exceptions. Any other thoughts on that? Mandy. I'm just going back to the bylaw. The bylaw talks about um, 
properties and as as Rob said, properties and dwelling units in, exempt from inspection. So occasional rentals are dwelling units. Um, yeah, I, I think we could potentially go to the original language unless the dwelling unit or property or, you know, unless the dwelling unit or property as applicable is exempt from exemption under the bylaw, something like that. Um, because it, it's just a weird, right now it says the residential rental property shall be inspected unless the dwelling unit is exempt. Well, if one dwelling unit is exempt, does that mean the whole property doesn't get inspected, right? And so we could say each residential rental property Or dwelling unit still be inspected. Because some of them exempt the property, some of them, some of the exemptions exempt the property, some of the exemptions exempt the dwelling unit from inspection, exempt certain dwelling units. You know, an owner occupied parcel, the owner occupied dwelling unit is exempt from inspection, but not the whole property. But an occasional rental, the whole property is exempt from inspection, I think under the bylaw. So. Any other thoughts on that? That seems, that seems to work for me. Want to keep going? Let's move down to number three then. And does that meet, Rob? Does that help clarify in your mind that it it it's an and or, not necessarily one of one or the other? Yes, it does. Thank you. We need to go back up to three, Mandy. Sorry, we still had those those time frames. So number two, um, this is one. This is one B three. Let's just make sure we're clar we've clarified that. Residential property with 10 or more dwelling units should be subject to inspections on the schedule deemed necessary to inspect at least 10% of the total number of dwelling units at least every five years, but no less than 10 dwelling units. And though it doesn't make a huge difference in the workload, um, it, it also gives enough um, flexibility, I guess, for um, Large, the larger properties. Is everyone comfortable with that before we move on? Okay. Uh, number two, really hard to read, I'm squinting here. Um, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, the number of units inspected with less than 10 dwelling units, 100% of the dwelling units should be inspected. And again, we, we um, so we've lowered the number of units in a property below which 100% gets inspected. To be for properties larger than 10, there is discretion. Whoops, we shall we shall inspect a sampling, but we still have the we still have the count above to dictate uh, at least ten percent, if I'm not mistaken. Is that, 
I'm looking at Rob. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I'm just not sure the reference to the section is correct. B1, C3. So that's what I'm looking at now. I think it's B1, B3. Uh, Mandy can look at that. Thank you. Everyone feel comfortable. Uh, Jennifer, sorry, you got your hand up. Yeah, I'm just <clears throat> a little confused. So if it's 10 or less, you inspect all the units. If it's 12, you only have to do 10%. I'm sure I got that, have that wrong. You'd still have to do 10. 10 and then just 10% of that above. No. Above the 10. 10 not less than 10 dwelling units. So, yeah, I, so it you would know be what I'm looking at. I guess I'm wrong. I was looking at 2B, but we're not there. Sorry. Yeah, no, 2B two, yeah. two right. references this one here. That was what the attorney, okay. we had a conflict there. And so the attorney, we rewrote it to reference. So if you've got a property that has between 10 and 100, 10 would get inspected. When you cross 100, 10% would get inspected. Right, okay, I just went to, okay. I was not quite understanding to be, but I just want to make sure it wasn't what. So to be, if you have 10 or more dwelling units, the code enforcement does a sampling, I, I but it, there have to be at least 10 inspected plus. Yeah. Yeah. Thank that, you. That it, it ensures compliance with this. Okay. Thank you. I think we are, um, yeah, if we could go to, to item number three, actually, back back up to three, inspection standards. This is something that was brought up um, by a couple of people, and um, there was a request for a, a top 10 uh, list of uh, inspection criteria or what we're going to look for. And the response to that was that if you're inspecting, you're going to inspect for health and safety with the applicable codes as dictated by the state that you're not going to uh, necessarily just do a, a short checklist. However, in in our um, in three, let's see, three A and three B and 3C, it does say that there's some sort of a checklist. So the question to Rob is, are we going to, should we should we be asking for a checklist as sort of an, uh, uh, an appendage to this document? Since we seem to be asking for a checklist, you would obviously at some point, if this were enacted, it would be something that um, a potential landlord would go looking for. You could give a little bit of feedback here on 3A, B, C. Sure. So I think, you know, as far as how we educate landlords and make them aware of the program, the checklist will include a document that is a checklist. You know, so we could be inspecting under, you know, the exterior of the property for zoning matters. And that's a much shorter checklist that's easy, you know, to prepare and show. But once we enter the unit, it's conduct, the, the inspection is conducted following the housing code. And that's a very comprehensive uh, checklist. So um, if a tenant contacts uh, the health department and asks for an inspection, we are obligated to follow that. So I think, I think for advertising, you know, for making everyone aware of our program, it would be the list of things that we would do in response to a complaint or during our inspection. And that would include our housing inspection list, which is very comprehensive state, the set by state code. And that's a document that's readily available. 
So we could leave this in in here, re referring to a checklist, and it would be something that that your department would have developed and or have have available. We would. I think there may be, you know, there may be a, you know, what you would expect if we are responding to a zoning complaint or something related to the grounds or parking related on the exterior of the property. And that might have its own, you know, section in checklist form of parking on paved surfaces and not in the setback. So, you know, there could be things like that that are developed as well. Uh, so it isn't, you know, necessary, not every, not the entire scope of what we may be dealing with doesn't necessarily apply to every complaint and every inspection. Yeah, and Mandy, you just you just highlighted for a just these are the topics that would be covered, essentially. So, um, Rob, thinking about this, if this is enacted, um, is there a fair amount of work that is needed on the town website for sort of upgrading the? the form, the application, the website, the link, so that it's easy for people to find their way to this kind of information. Absolutely, there's a lot of work needed. <laughs> you, okay, thank you. That was the that was the end of my questions. Does anyone else have questions or comments on the material within the regulations? And if you could read it that quickly, you're you're good. <laughs> So here again, we have our we have our B inspection checklist. And that just just for clarification, number letter C, the tenant information sheet, is the one prepared by the town. It is not the same as the state mandated um, document that was shared with us by one of the landlords, who just basically said this you know this is getting passed out to every tenant. And it talks about life safety and and the rights of the tenant. And the landlord has has his or her own requirements of what they have to provide in their lease or in their in their handouts to their tenants. Uh, does anyone have any other comments about this? If we have if we have come to general agreement on this document, does anyone want to make a motion to that effect? Andy. I think the last time we did motions, we did them all as one bylaw regulations and fee structure. And I certainly would like to talk about the fee structure before I personally vote on a new recommendation on the regulations and potentially go back to the bylaw too, given some of the concerns we've heard. So I, I would request that we hold off any additional motion until we've been through all three. Sounds fine. I was you know looking for some accomplishment that we could, <laughs> could enjoy for the moment. Oh, I uh, still think we can do it today. But... <laughs> Okay, let's talk about fees next. Thank you, Rob, for your input on, on that topic. Andy, could you pull up the schedule? Cover sheet. Yeah. Uh, with the benefit, the benefit of our 
for the benefit of myself and for any newer members of the CRC, um, the fee schedule and the documentation that, that has been developed, um, including the Excel spreadsheets that we're allowing people to sort of play with different numbers to understand what the costs were for a program such as this and what the um, essentially, if we were to go ahead with this, what is the coverage that we should have to make this a workable program? And so all of the all of the little spreadsheets with various numbers in it uh, that that were um, interchangeable um, are in support of this summary. Um, on, the, on the fee schedule itself. Any comments on the fee schedule? Andy. So this fee schedule, we have not talked about. What it shows is requests and for changes made by a counselor, but we never discussed those changes. Um, and but particularly with the inspection, but also with the other parcels. Um, and so I'm not sure this is the sheet that was most helpful to look at. Um, I think a spreadsheet or, um, we have several different spreadsheets. Options. We we have several different, right? And so I'm trying to figure out, I created a bunch and I'm trying to figure out which one is is the best to pull up. Um, I'm gonna... While you're, while you're thinking about that, I'm, I'm gonna add um, just some of, the, some of the thoughts that came from the, uh, from all of the conversations that we've been having since two years ago, um, but that it was, stated strongly that the fees that are collected have to equal the service provided that we're not we're not taxing people um, and that a, a number of people suggested there there are many different ways to assess a fee um, and we have heard we have heard one flat fee for every property we have heard fees proportional to uh, the size of, of the property and the number of units on it. We have heard fees proportional to the assessed value of the property. Um, and then we have also discussed um, fees per unit that would, um, with a cap or particular, you know, for, pro for properties. So those are all of the variations that we've heard on so Mandy, can you tell us what you have here that looks different than yes <laughs> so so this is the one i think that might be slightly helpful um to describe what's going on and then if we want to actually look at options i can pull up a spreadsheet and we can depending on which of these option one option two we like um we could potentially pull up a spreadsheet and figure out whether we want to actually re recommend changes to the originally recommended fee schedule. Um, so the top row, this is what CRC voted to recommend to the, the council adopt back in November. Um, I think it was November, um, which is an application fee for a hundred of a hundred dollars for owner occupied units and two hundred and fifty dollars for non owner occupied units plus fifty dollars each additional dwelling rental dwelling unit above one with a maximum application fee of seven hundred dollars and an inspection fee of one hundred and fifty dollars per unit for every inspection whether that be the required inspection under the program or an inspection done in, as a result of a complaint made to the inspections department um, or anything like that, a, a re-inspection. If the first inspection failed and the department has to go back, that inspection too. 
um, that that and and that we would be inspecting twenty five units minimum of the large apartments or twenty percent. Um, and so what you can see here is with that recommendation, the estimated base revenue was four hundred and sixty two thousand dollars, four hundred and sixty three thousand dollars out of a rest estimated program cost of four seventy four. Um, base revenue does not include um, inspection rev um, um, inspection revenue other than the initial the inspection required to obtain the permit, the one that needs done every five years. So it doesn't include estimated complaint or reinspection fee revenue. Um, this column here, is how much of the strategic partnership agreement revenue would required to be used in order to cover um, the program costs, the estimated program costs of 474,000 because application and inspection fees fall short of 474. So for this first one, the fee schedule we recommended would use 11,000, an estimated 11,000 of the strategic partnership revenue that is meant for, um, I, I don't know what the wording on that one is, Dave Zomet can probably be better. There's a potential reven additional revenue for complaint and reinspections of 50,000, but we had heard from Rob in previous meetings that that, re that, that in those inspections are not always charged a fee. Um, and I added a column here that is an estimated number of inspections, 628, um, under the 25 units, 20%. So there was a counselor that asked for a couple of revisions to that fee schedule. The first big revision was the 10 units, 10%. So that's that's the only sort of revision made under option one is changing the number of in units inspected. So you'll see that over here in the last column is the estimated inspected number of inspected units is 496. What that changes is the inspection fee revenue from 94,000 down to 74,000, which means the total estimated base revenue changes. Um, and it would be estimated that we would need to, the town would need to supplement the inspection program, the fees received under the program with 30,000 of the strategic partnership agreement money, um, complaint and reinspection fee estimates, that number's there. That's option one. Option two, and, and, and that one, so, so at a minimum, that's the one we're looking at um, if we're going to go with regulations at 10% and 10 um, so this is the number we're looking at. Option two is the 10 units, 10%, but adds a different change in it, which was the inspection changes that was shown on the initial sheet that popped up that I, I said might not be helpful. Um, and that, that changes two things. Option two changes two things. First, it changes the application fee for non-owner occupied units would be reduced from 250 plus $50 per unit above one with a max of 700 to 150 plus $50 um, per unit above one with a max of 1100 as an application fee, um, which is um, an extra, I think it's 20, it, it's instead of the max 700 at 250 and 50 was paying, was an application fee for up to 10 units. Um, the 1100 is um, an eight, nine, 10, it's up to 20 units. So you would be paying that additional 50 for an up to 20 uh, up to 19 additional units. Any parcel that has more than 20 units would be maxed out at 1,100. In the original proposal, any parcel above 10 rental units is maxed out at 700. So that's one of the changes, the application fee. So you'll see that the application fee actually goes down. Um, the estimated application fee revenue is reduced. The other change the counselor asked us to consider was under inspection fees, 
where the inspection fee would be $150 for each dwelling unit that is on the five-year inspection plan. So if it's getting inspected once every five years. But if there is a property that is getting inspected yearly because it has had multiple violations and X, Y, Z of the things, then it would the inspection fee would be $250 per inspection. Um, but it would also be $250 for any complaint or reinspection. So an inspection following a failed inspection. So um, given that option, you'll see the one, the number that changes with that potential option is over here on complaint and reinspection fees. And the reason this seven, the, the required inspection fee did not change from the 10 unit 10% is because I can't estimate how many dwelling units or properties would be on a more frequent schedule. And so this 74,000 is potentially under option two, an underestimate, but it's because we can't estimate how many would be on a more frequent schedule to be able to do that estimation. What you see here is the base revenue is 355, which means you would conservatively need to use 118,000 of the strategic partnerships, $100,000 in um, revenue. I'm happy to answer questions <laughs> about the spreadsheet, or if we want to see an Excel spreadsheet and play with numbers, I can pull that one up too. So basically to, to give you an idea, option one right now is, ba is, is what the current revenue would be under the policy, under the regulations we have just tentatively, we haven't voted them yet, but that we've just gone over and modified under the current draft modified regulations, option one is showing the estimated revenue. Uh, uh, the Please. recommended one is now out of date in theory. Jennifer, thank you, Mandy. Yeah, thank you, Mandy. <clears throat> um, so I like an option two, I like the new application fee schedule so that if someone has one unit, two units, I mean, if they have one unit, they're paying $150 instead of $250. So I like that better. If less revenue is generated from that than in option one, and we need that additional revenue, is it possible that instead of maxing out that basically 20 units, you max out if you have 20 or more? I mean, could we make that, if if you're a complex with 100, I mean, could we have you max out later? So if you have 40 units, you're paying more than a building with 20 units. I mean, would that help make up for some of the revenue that we're losing from option one? Mandy, you still have your hand up. Would you like me to answer that? Sorry, my hand's still up. Um, yes, it would change the um, application fee revenue. It would It would put it above 281. Um, I can go to the spreadsheet to change those numbers to to show you where it would be. I can't do it in my head. Um, but it it would it would change this number. I'm gonna weigh in here as well. So um I'm I'm thinking that having a consistent inspection fee, whether it's for whatever purpose, I think is a more a mo the most reasonable way to go in terms of just if it's an inspection you're going to put time and energy into it let's not differentiate between one type and another we we talked about um different fees for um different circumstances like owner occupied or you know this or that and and it was determined that from the staffing standpoint that it made more sense to have a simplified schedule, fee schedule. And I and I feel like the same applies here. Um, reflecting, I think what, what I heard Jennifer say, the maximum number 
um, if you look at eleven hundred dollars for um, uh, a property of four hundred units or three hundred units, um, the the per the per unit cost is is fairly low com uh, compared to what a single family house um, ends up paying. Um, and I and I think it wouldn't it wouldn't bother me. Um, I mean, all of this bothers me. It's, I I really would love to not have to have these kinds of fees, but I think having a a higher maximum um, makes sense just from uh, the scale of things. Andy, you have your hand up. So. I agree with Pam that I don't like the requested consideration of a change in making the inspection fee differential. I think that complicates things and we were trying to be a little less complicated in a fee schedule. So I don't like option two's inspection fee change. Um, so if we wanted to look at potential options for application fees, I would request that we look so under option one, not option two, so that we're not dealing with the inspection fee issue. Um, I think given that the application fee is frankly subsidizing the inspections too, the inspection, you know, given the program and all of the inspections that are going and given when you look at these, that were the the fee revenue, it, the inspection fee is not covering the cost of the inspections. So the application fee, in some sense, is is covering portions of the required inspection um, of the program as a whole. And if if that is going to be the case, while I do actually still agree with a separate inspection fee. Um, even though we are setting it lower than the costs of the inspection portion of the program, um, and we're setting the application fee sort of to include portions of the in required inspection. Um, given that we have just decreased the inspections, required inspections to 10 units or 10%. Um, I struggle with maxing, adding a per unit fee above 10 units because those units are not those additional units are not necessarily contributing to the cost of the program because we're basically inspecting 10 units on many of these. Um, but if we lower the number to 150, we don't have enough and the goal was to basically have the estimated total revenue base be close to 474. And, and so the other potential, if we want to lower the one unit cost to 150 for non-owner occupied is to look at adding, uh, increasing the per unit cost above that, but still maxing out at 10 and seeing what that does but I'm not sure I can support increasing the max number of units charged above 10 because we're only inspecting 10. No. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, for the application fee, I, 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 am, I don't have a problem charging per unit maybe I misunderstand, more increasing the number of units, maxing out higher. That if you have a large, if we need the revenue, if the if the program requires the revenue, 
we a, a lot of concern over the last 10 years has been that if you own you have one unit or a hundred, you're paying the same application fee. And I would really like to keep the application fee for the smaller non-owner occupied for a single unit at $150. And if someone's, so it, if we need to generate more revenue, I would like to see it come from increasing the max on the larger um, complexes. Have a, go ahead, Pat. Yeah, I, um, I have a question about the uh, strategic partnership revenue in 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 the um, section second option. We're using more of that money, and it, this may be naive on my part, but the strategic partnership money is supposed to go to other issues around town too. Um, so I'm I'm uh, unsettled with an increase in that usage to 118,000. I'm also, I'm, I, I feel like, I, I don't agree with Jennifer about dropping the uh, cost for someone with, a, with small units or one unit. I think I'm just not comfortable with that. I'm not being very articulate, I apologize. So Pat, can you can you explain which what you would support for the fee for a non owner occupied unit then? For me, I think it would be um, uh, the max of seven hundred. I f I feel I feel more comfortable with option one. And I'm certainly interested in listening to more and I oh Rob what was that there were all these balloons that went up in your picture <laughs> anyway I the other thing it's I'd like to hear Rob on some of this and Dave on some of this as well yes. Dave yeah what I can say there's not a lot to say about the hundred thousand dollars in the strategic partnership agreement, other than you know when we negotiated that it was generally to be used on initiatives that made rental housing safer and healthier for all. So, you know, I think you know Rob and I have had a number of discussions about this. Some of them with Paul. I think Paul is aware that obviously aware that this is being, you know, um, looked at as part of the, the revenue stream for the program that, that you've outlined here with Rob's support over the last many months. So um, I, I think it absolutely should be considered in, in the, in the mix here. Um, there were no, there were no uh, specific strings attached, I guess I would say, that it was to be used generally to support making rental units in Amherst safer. And of course, UMass has the interest of their their students in mind, but the program is is a broad program that will will ultimately result in safer units for UMass undergrads and graduates off campus. Thank you, Dave. That's helpful. Rob, anything to add? Sort of along the same lines, I guess I was always of the opinion is, you know, that money should be accounted for, you know, as much as we need it to be. Uh, I'm not sure what else we're going to do with it. And I think in the first five years, it seems very useful to put it into this program and then decide from there what Paul might have for other initiatives that could use some of that money. But I think in the first five years, it seems very appropriate to put into this. I also wanted to uh, just mention that, you know, the original $474,000 estimate included the $50,000 legal estimate in that breakdown. Uh, and, you know, 
the town budgets for legal fees in other ways, you know, and it's, there's no way to account for how much we will or will not use uh, to, to uh, support the actions that are taken by this department. So uh, I actually feel like option two is, you know, doable when we consider kind of the reality of some of these numbers shifting uh, year to year and what, what might actually incur for an expense. Thank you, uh, Mandy Joe. And then, and then I think we've talked about this a bit. I would, I would like to open up. I see a couple of hands in the audience, and I wouldn't mind hearing some folks weigh in on that. Thanks. So, I, the finance committee, um, to report on some of their report. Um, sort of as that I was attending while I was chair of CRC indicated because these estimates are really just that estimates that they would rather see an initial fee schedule that estimates revenue as cl or close, much closer to the estimated program costs such that the strategic partnership agreement amount may not necessarily be needed to run the program or not all of it to mainly give the program a little leeway in the first year or two because we don't know whether that revenue estimate is is as it is is as good as it needs to be right we we can guess all we want we can do the numbers we can do the projections but after when all is said and done, we don't know what the actual revenue will be until the program is in place. And so um, what's shown as option one gives us some ability to, you know, make sure that the program is runnable using, if the estimated base revenue comes in lower than expected there is still enough money for the program because there's some there's some additional you know an option one seventy thousand dollars um that that could go um you know i would be open to opening the spreadsheet pooling up option one the only difference option one is easily the spreadsheet and option one is easily changeable to change that 250 to a 150 and the max to 1100 so that we can see what the revenue options are um because because the big thing with the option two spreadsheet is it's got this inspection fee thing and if we're not going to do that we can we can pull up the spreadsheet and plug some numbers in and see i think i'd rather if we think 250 is too much, I'd rather look at increasing the per unit additional from 50 to 70 or 75 than increasing the max number of units that is accounted for. It would increase, obviously, the max that 700 might go up, but I would look at keeping it at nine additional units, but maybe changing 50 to a higher number and one 250 down to potentially 200 or something. But we can play with that if we pull up that spreadsheet. But I think. I would like to see the estimated total base revenue closer to 474 or in at least the 400s, if not near 450, um, with whatever we recommend. Jennifer, you had your hand up, and I was I was going to weigh in as well. Well, I was just going <clears> to <throat> say that I, um, I I could agree with that that if we went down to the 150 and then raised from 50 to 70 or 75, <clears throat> excuse me, to not have to go above the 700. That, I th that's a good suggestion too. My, my comment was slightly different and that was that <clears throat> having the 150 plus uh, the, the $50 per unit um, to me is, is not an onerous fee, but that I would actually encourage us going a little higher in the maximum because there are some, in fact, properties that have 200 units or 300 units. And so they're, we're, we're talking application fee, not 
um, not inspection fees. And so that having a, a relatively smaller additional fee per additional unit um, doesn't seem, it doesn't seem as onerous to me, um, especially if we, if we drop the, if we drop the fee down to 150. I'm not sure if we're tracking that well. Um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to let Andy Joe pull up that spreadsheet, but I'm going to go to the audience. Renata Shepard has her hand up and I know she has a comment on fees. Renata, can you, can you bring yourself in or David can bring her in and, and unmute? Name and address, please. Hi, <laughs> you know me so well, <laughs> Renata Shepard, <laughs> you want Justice Drive Amherst. Um, yeah, really, the fairness of this needs to be looked again. I do like the idea of going back to the spreadsheet. And I'm going to give you a, a really concrete example. For example, I have a two-bedroom condo that, you know, the outside is regulated by the condo and, and behavior, trash, whatever is regulated by the condo. It, it is rented for less than $600 a month. And it's going to have to go up because of all the, you know, taxes, fees, et cetera. Why am, am, would I be paying $250, which is way above 10% of my, my income for the month, um, when other condos, let's say similar, would go for $1,800, $2,000, I've seen $2,100, and they're similar. And I'm trying to keep mine low because my tenants have been there for 10, over 10 years. And, you know, but I won't be able to do this for very long. Um, a person that has a duplex, non-owner occupied duplex that would rent each side for $2,000 would pay $300. If you go by the 250 plus 50. And yet they're making three times more than I'm making. Um, a four bedroom house that has for students that might be partying, whatever, that are making $4,000 a month will pay two fifty, And they have a lot of inspections to do because you have to inspect inside and out and it's a bigger, bigger house. So why not reduce it to $100 per unit up to 1000 Because if you have two units, you're going to be making $1,800, $2,000 per unit. $100 per unit will not be unreasonable i mean all these fees are unreasonable i have to say but i know you guys are not going to back down on this so <laughs> i'm trying to figure out a way of not going out of business um really my children cannot live in this house they have to live with me because it, they cannot afford renting in this house they would not be able to buy in, the, in, in this town um it, it it is very sad, very very sad. Um, so really, um, play with that with that spreadsheet and see if you can do maybe I don't know a hundred dollars for the first unit, a hundred dollars for the second, up to a thousand, and then you know have a maximum or or go by revenue. I don't know, but it, it needs to be more fair. Because no matter how I look at this, it is not fair. Why would somebody with three units would pay much less than me that have one unit? So, yeah, please take a look at that spreadsheet and see if there's something that can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Renata. I'm not seeing other hands in the audience. So let's go back to the spreadsheets. Thank you, Mandy, for doing that. Uh, if I may, can I explain a couple of things and then we can change some numbers? Sure. Just, just so people 
know what we're going to be looking at. Um, this is this is the spreadsheet as option one showed. So it will say this. It will have the same numbers as the document we were just looking at that was under option one. Owner occupied parcels up to six units, a hundred dollars base fee. No additional fee per rental unit above one unit. Um, Non-owner occupied parcels, 250 per permit plus $50 for everyone above. When you go over here, that's where the max fee with the guardrails is charged. You can see it's set up to be per nine units for additional nine units plus the base. So a total of 10 units, anything above 10, that is not the maximum. Um, total fees collected. So um, total number of rental units for the guardrail collection is on a different spreadsheet. It references a different spreadsheet. So if we change that nine to 10, I have to go to over here and, and find that number. And that's this one here. And I would fix that number if we move up to 20 for some guardrail numbers. Um, but the one, the one I really wanted to point out when we change those numbers on the first tab, this is the column we're looking at right here on what the total estimated revenue will be. The number in bold right here um, is the total estimated revenue. This number is how much of strategic partnership agreement money would need to be used to make up and get up to the 474 estimated total program costs. If the number in B8 is larger than 100,000, there isn't enough strategic partnership revenue because the strategic partnership revenue is $100,000. And then we can change numbers or if people have questions about how the spreadsheet is set up, I'm happy to answer them too. Mandy, could you go back to the previous sheet, the one with the um, the green in it? No. This one or this one? Yeah, that one. So in your, in your column E, you have all other parcels max of nine additional units charged. The number here that is shown is 1,505. In fact, we have 4,952 units. Are you capping that at nine units or 10 units total? So we, we really don't get to count the additional 3,000 units that we have in town that in a in a sense ought to be contributing to this algorithm so the fee schedule said you would cap the maximum fee at seven hundred dollars which is a fee of one unit for the base permit and nine additional units paying the extra additional fee per rental unit for a total of 10 units so how do i figure out how much total fees collected are that when we have 4,900 total rental non-owner occupied units. What I do is take this number here, that 1505 is here. And as you can see, it looks at F3, the, these approximate total numbers of units. It looks at all of these until we get to, it, it, it adds up these numbers F3 through F10, because those are the approximate number of units in buildings with two rental units all the way through nine rental units. Nine was considered, we have one building with nine rental units. If it's got nine rental units and there's one building, there's exactly nine units there in the nine rental unit buildings. In the six rental unit buildings, there are 15 buildings that have six rental units. And so six times 15. Yep. Um, but once you get to 10 rental, 10 to 19 rental units, only 10 are being charged that fee. Only a nine additional ones are being charged the fee. So how did I do that calculation? When I got to F11, I added up the total number of parcels that had 10 or more units. And it would be that number of parcels times nine additional units. So the to question, add, the question add to that. And so that means if we are maxing out the guardrails at nine additional units plus the original unit, there are 1,505 units that would pay that extra $50 total. Okay. 
total across the board. If we max that out at 20 units or 19 units plus the base fee, I would be changing this calculation, basically moving this 19, the C11 would become a C12 and I would add an F11 in. But I can do that if we want to do that. That's what I'm saying. Once when we play with numbers, I can make those changes. It will just you'll you'll get to see me make the changes here so that when when we play with them, you can actually see what these numbers are. So I think the question that the that the committee needs to consider is 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 capping the number of units that we that we uh, apply the fee to, the administration fee to, um, is it appropriate to cap it at 10 units total? Um, again, as the speaker just said, the benefit to the larger, the larger properties is that they essentially get a discount um, for having many more than, than 10 units. And, the, and that, so that's the question that I would like to pose to the committee. Andy. So as I said, I think capping at 10 units is logical for an application fee. Rob has told this committee many times that the processing of the application is no different for a parcel with one unit than a parcel with 100 units. Um, and so if fees have to relate to costs, it's hard to justify an application fee that changes dramatically for a 100 unit building than a one unit building when the processing of the application itself is the same cost to the town, which is why I started the conversation originally with it's clear that the application fees, when you look at the application and the inspection fees are subsidizing the inspections too. It's not just the cost of processing the application that the application fee is paying for. It's also a portion of the required inspection under that application that it's paying for. And then we're adding an additional uh, inspection fee on top of it. If we're only going to inspect, inspect a maximum of 10 units, it seems disingenuous of me, disingenuous to, to me to, in, to charge an additional, an, an application fee for the 30th, 40th, or 50th unit on that parcel when only the first, only 10 of them will be inspected in a five-year period. But that's one of the reasons I suggested maybe we increase the per unit, the additional unit fee for the application because that first 10 is subsidizing that inspection fee. Where the big difference comes is that inspection fee is per unit too in the number of units inspected. So that 150 inspection fee for a one unit rental is $150. For a 10 or 100 unit rental is $1,500 because 10 units are getting inspected. For the 206, 200 unit property, it's a $3,000 inspection fee on top of the application fee. And we can't forget that, that that's getting paid too by the units. It's not just the application fee every year, it's the inspection fee too. Um, my other concern, I would say with reducing the base fee is most of our rentals will not pay anything above the base fee. And so reducing that makes it hard to pay for the program. And we've also heard that it's those one and two and three unit rentals that sometimes cause the most problems. Thank you. Thank you for a very thorough, very thorough explanation. <laughs> um, Jennifer, and then, and then I want to yeah, just, you know, uh, for us all kind of to be mindful that when we talk about the inspection fee, it's once every five years, so it's not an annual. Correct? <laughs> yeah, just, just just in terms of, you know, for, for the community and the public that the 
just to keep bearing in mind that the inspections happen once every five years, not every year, like the permit fee. Thank you. So we've, this is this has always been a very a very slippery slope and a very uh, complicated conversation because it's uh, it's trying to weigh a lot of different elements um, in trying to implement something as equitably as it can be, or at least as consistently as it can be, and perhaps inequitably. Um, I want to I want to take a pause. It's quarter after eight, and we have fifteen minutes that we I want to spend at least five minutes talking about uh, calendar. I'm looking for uh, interest in pursuing this for another five minutes or something. If if Mandy could do two things, one is to put a date on this example so that we know this is the one that we talked about on February 13. And to create some, um, some comparable charts that are like this, but for each chart to label it like an today's date A, B, and C so that we have, or option one, two, and three, so we have something that we can um, much more carefully study individually and be prepared to talk about this at the next meeting, which is the 27th. Any thoughts, Mandy? So what I could do is play with the spreadsheet and give me a second and create a document Let me, like the one I initially showed, I have to get it up again. Um, I could create a document like this that shows options between 100 and 250 plus 50 max 700 and 150 plus 100, 150 plus 50 plus max of 1100. Um, something with options that are up to 10 units, up to 20 units, but somehow fit within. So, so, you know, maybe a 250 plus 50, a 200 plus 100, a 200 plus 75, a 150 plus 75, a 150 plus 100, something like that. And create, instead of all the spreadsheets with that, create a chart like this in a Word document that shows the results of me plugging in those numbers and then um, shows application fee, um, what, 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 this, what this line was, um, including instead of just the max number, how many units contribute to that max number, something like that. And I can just create an option, you know, like six or seven different options like that, that all fit in. If, if the committee gives me an idea do we want them all using $100,000 or less of the SPA? Like this one here uses more than is available. Um, so in my mind, it's not even an option because it it doesn't give the program enough operating costs potentially. Um, but I could work with numbers to try and find a way to get every option using $100,000 or less of the strategic partnership agreement if that's what the committee would like. I'm going to weigh in on that. I, if you would keep that option, I think that's important to understand what what creates the overage, and just keep that as the the, the least desirable. But at least it shows us the the sideboards between most expensive and less expensive. And I truly appreciate if you would do that. I would I would say keep it to, I don't know, four new options total. And we've heard we've heard a couple things that the the cap could stay the same, the per unit um, application might go up a little bit after the first unit, um, and then um, 
that we heard. Or and also with with a um a hundred dollar initial application fee plus a hundred dollars for each dwelling unit up to a thousand dollars was one suggestion tonight. So we'll make sure that gets included. Okay, I, I will create something. It might end up with more than four options, but I will I will create something. Really appreciate it. And so if that could go into the SharePoint when you're done with it, put it into the SharePoint and just say, as discussed, February 13 would be very helpful. Will do. Thank you so much. Uh, let's transition. So I think Rob and, well, Dave's still here, but but Rob, I think we're done with this discussion for tonight. We'll come back to it. Um, on the 20th on. Appreciate your feedback. That's very helpful. And so if we could transition to the conversation about the calendar. This is totally um, at, at my call. And the only reason I wanted to bring it up again for discussion is that I realized as we were looking at all of September, all of October, all of November, and and all of December that our CRC meetings would fall the day after a town council meeting, all of those all of those months. And I I don't mind following some and some of the dates um, are already like I think April 9, uh, April uh, June 25 follows immediately after a meeting, but you know, I'm I'm comfortable with it happening sometimes, but I was I was staying a little uncomfortable having it four months in a row of back to back. Any other thoughts? And if it's the will of the group, I'm fine, but I just want to at least discuss it again. Mandy. So November and December are only other options because of the holidays in November and December and the holiday weeks are to do two meetings in a row and only have one of them right after a council meeting. Right now they're all November, December are also on the same day as finance. That affects me. I'm okay with it. Um, I will have three meetings in the span of like 26 hours. Um, you know, I, I'm okay with it. Um, because I'd, I'd like to see CRC be able to meet twice each of those months. And I feel like November, uh, November 12th, I'm not sure is even an option because I think that's a holiday. Um, no, I think November 12th might be a holiday. 11th is a holiday. The 11th, oh, Monday's the holiday. So we could do the 12th, but 12, 19 is two weeks in a row. And I just feel like the space that that's just really tough to do two weeks in a row for the same committee. I think it's easier to get stuff organized if they're better spaced. Um, so, so, that sounds, so that sounds like November five and 19 could remain November five and 19, that there's not a lot of flexibility there. And same with December three and 17, unless you want two weeks in a row. So so then I will say that if you change the September ones, um, they would likely then be on the same day as finance. I haven't gone through and looked, but Athena originally set up this calendar so that one and three were finance and two and four were CRC. And mm -hmm. so if we move the two and fours to one and three um, in September and October, it will be four months of finance and CRC on the same day. Fine. And so I will also say finance is generally meeting the day after council meetings the rest of the year, oh, <laughs> right? Um, there is a meeting basically every Tuesday the whole year, and it's either this committee or finance. We need more days in the week. Um, so in that in that sense, in that case, if we keep, we'll keep November 5 and 19, that- What's wrong with November 12th? I'm sorry. November 12th? 
Is that there's no council meeting the eleventh? That's Veterans Day. It just puts two meetings in a row, 12 and 19. We would and have... so it's whether the committee wants to do that. No one no one wanted a meeting on the 26th of November, even though it's it's a couple days before Thanksgiving. Right. <clears throat> um, okay, so no, are we meeting on November 5th? That's election day. That's what we're scheduled for. I think I'd rather meet on the, I don't know, 12th in the night. I, I see, because you only two weeks, but I, I mean, I guess on one hand, meeting on election day is a distraction, but I, I'm i going to be very, <laughs> I don't know. Polls don't yeah. close till eight. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's no information till like 820. <laughs> you know. It's the emotional load that we'll all be bearing. Yeah. As we near the election. I mean, I can go either way. I mean, it's fine, but I was just thinking. For some reason, I didn't have the 19th on my calendar, so I'll put that on. Um, so back to back to September, sorry. So September uh, finances on what days? Finance on, is on September 3 and 17. I mean, I will do it. I I, I don't I think you should have to do it. I think we're. I I feel more for Athena than I do for myself. Finance is two to four. This one's six thirty to eight thirty. So there's plenty of space in there. Um, but I feel more for Athena than I do for myself. Doing that to her for four months versus two. Mm -hmm. It also feels to me that yes, it's after a council meeting, which can be totally exhausting, but. It's happening in the evening. We have a whole day to recover. Um, so I don't see the point of changing these and make and glomming it on to Mandy Joe or Athena or anybody else's schedule in that way. I think it was my schedule this year, recognizing that I would need to get all of the material done by the week before because I'm trying to spend time on council stuff. Thursday, Friday, hopefully not much on Saturday and Sunday, but then Monday. So I was trying to get some of the chair duties spread out a little bit. Um, I'm well. You I'm, have a vice chair, so you, the two of you, can you. alternate and work. You thank can you. find ways to work that out. Thank you. Um, then let's just accept it as we originally voted, and I'll shut up. Okay, so I will let I will let Athena know that we haven't changed a single date, and she can go hire her her, her note takers. Okay, it is eight twenty eight. Do we have any do we have any other business? Let's see. Where's my list? Uh, we do not have minutes that I saw. Um, any announcements? Mandy. Sorry, it's a next agenda. Well, an right. agenda item request, I guess, more than an announcement, um, okay. if that's okay. Sure. That's At fun. some point, I wonder if we can find some time to ask the planning director in. The planning board has been discussing a lot of stuff. And this might be a better agenda item for potentially after the retreat that the council might have at some point, but the planning board's been discussing a lot about a potential revision to zoning over on University Drive, and it might be good for us as CRC, the other committee that would have to make a recommendation on that if it comes to the council to get an update on that, maybe, mm -hmm. if the chair thinks it's logical and all, but it might also be worth doing that sometime after a council retreat where we might be discussing zoning priorities anyway. But I thought I'd put that little request in. Sure. Sounds Thanks. like a good one. And, and um, since I listen into the zoning or to the planning board, you, most of the time anyway, 
um, it'll be easy to get a sense of when they think they have kind of a, a handle on things and if they're starting to come to consensus on the approach they want to take. And it would be a really, you know, good opportunity to um, have have a, an overview provided to us. That'd be great. Good idea. I do want, um, theoretically, I'm going to be talking at least with Paul and maybe David this week. I put in a request to um, at least talk through with staff how they might want to be incorporated into the conversation about the solar bylaw. And I'm just trying to get a sense of what their time frame might be, how they want to be integrated into this conversation. And I was hoping to have that conversation with Paul before the end of this week, or at least by the end of this week. And that was going to give us a sense of um, how to start structuring the solar bylaw conversation. So that's still a, a future agenda item. We have not talked about nuisance bylaw for some time. It ties in directly to the conversation that we had tonight. Um, it is yet another keg cog in the wheel. Um, so that's still a future agenda item as well. No items uh, anticipated within 48 hours. Is there anything else anyone wants to add to future items? Jennifer. I'm sorry if I missed it. So we'll do the nuisance and the rental bylaw, the rental. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think we, we need to, we probably could <clears throat> we talk about the bylaw. We didn't even touch that tonight. Um, at some point, um, I'd like to get through fees and really have a robust conversation about that. And then we can talk about nuisance. So it, there may be time for it next week, next time, but if not, the following. After that, okay. Pat, anything else? Counselor Essay, anything else? <laughs> okay, then I think we could adjourn. It's eight thirty-two. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Oh, Dave, before you close down, um, were we going to be able to see the YouTube recording from last week?